I am the assistant program manager of uh, events and outreach for Be Well. And um, before we pass things over to Patty to give her wonderful presentation on resilience in uncertain times, I would just like to give you a refresher on the Be Well program and just remind you what is available to you through the program. So um, we are a benefits program focused on creating a culture of wellness at Stanford where all are valued, supported, and inspired to thrive. So um, if Be Well is something that you haven't got into yet, we recommend that you, we encourage you to create your Be Well account. Um, creating your account ensures that you stay on our radar and we stay on yours um, because once you create your account, you'll receive our program reminders by email throughout the year. So in order to do so, you can visit our website at bewell.stanford.edu. You'll click on sign in in the upper right hand corner. And once you log in, this is what your account will look like. So as a reminder, the first step of the program is still the Shala. And the Shala is a questionnaire that will take you about 15, 20 minutes to answer. And once you complete your Shala, you'll get a report showing you areas that you're doing well in or areas that you might like to improve in. And completing the Shala is what unlocks the rest of the program for you. The next, step in the, pro the next step in the program is to complete the wellness profile. And the wellness profile traditionally consists of three steps, um, screening, advising, and plan. But because of the circumstances this year with COVID, screening is not required this year. So screening is an optional piece. You can submit screening results if you'd like to have them on file for reference, but it, you don't need to do that piece this year. For this year, the requirement is advising and plan. So advising is done by phone and you'll speak with one of our expert Be Well coaches on a wellness topic of your choosing, um, anything from stress management to nutrition, fitness, work-life balance. Um, and that phone call will last anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes. And after you complete advising, you'll receive a prompt prompting you to complete your plan. And the plan is completed online. You'll answer five questions regarding your advising appointment. And once you complete the plan, you earn a $200 incentive. And that incentive is paid out to you within two pay periods. The next step in the program is to complete engagement. And for this year, we've got three options for engagement. We have multi-session coaching, where you'll receive um, real-time support over a period of weeks from one of our Be Well coaches about your wellness needs. And this is a step approved option. We also have healthy living classes where you can take an online class or an app to give uh, you valuable skills that make wellness easier and more enjoyable. And this is also a staff approved option. And then lastly, we have commitment to family, community, or self-care. So for this option, you'll focus on your family, community, or personal wellness. So completing one of these options earns you an additional $260, and that is paid out to you in February of the following year. So for this year, February 2022. And then we also have berries. So for berries, you complete six berries, and that earns you an additional $100 incentive. And that incentive is also paid out to you within two pay periods. For berries, we have many, many options, but listed here, we have some um, examples. So this year we launched our Champions Network where you can become a wellness ambassador for your team. Um, we've got the healthy living classes, Stanford fitness classes, personal training and fitness assessments. You can watch up to three recorded webinars through your Be Well account for Berry credit. We have Stanford wellness classes and workshops, and then you can also earn Barry credit for activities that you're doing outside of Stanford on your own time. Okay, and our Healthy Living program is a program within Be Well, and it is a robust program of classes. So each year we are offering more than 300 evidence-based offerings on diverse wellness, wellness topics, um, including contemplative practices, stress and resiliency, which you'll hear more about from Patty today, um, nutrition and weight, prevention and medical management, health enrichment. All of these offerings are very eligible, staff funded, and some also qualify for the engagement incentive. 
So that is all that I have for you for the Be Well Refresher today. Here is just a reminder of all of the perks that are available to you through the program. And if you have not already signed up um, and it's something that you're interested in getting involved in, um, definitely encourage you to visit our website and create your Be Well account. So I will go ahead and stop sharing, and now I will be passing things over to Patty DeVries, um, who will be giving you a, a lovely presentation on resilience in uncertain times. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm delighted to be, be sharing today, and I'm just going to get my slides here up and showing for you so that we can get started. I'm really happy that you're here. Um, as Jamie said, my name is Patty. Perper DeVries, and I'm with the Be Well program. I'm the Director of Strategy, Outreach, and Innovation, and hope that um, each of you get a chance to check out our offerings as well. Today, we will be talking about um, rising with resilience in uncertain times. And first, I want to really acknowledge the place that many of you may be in. We're in still in very uncertain times where our physical needs at the base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs are being shaken somewhat. Um, there's uncertainty in the world and there's a lot of things happening. And I just wanna acknowledge that, that we may all be in the same storm, but we're certainly not in the same boat. I appreciate that each of you are here today as we really do focus on the top level of the pyramid and just taking this hour for yourself, for self-care and really tending to your needs in that area. We acknowledge that although burnout um, pri previous to COVID-19 was really a term we mostly used with our physicians here at Stanford, we talked about burnout as really running on empty. But in the last year with COVID and this odd spot that we're in, we're finding that most employees are starting to feel this sense of burnout, which is really a sense of having run out of fuel. The components of burnout that we just really wanna acknowledge um, especially if you're feeling those things, is a sense of personal exhaustion, emotional and physical exhaustion as well. A sense of deep depersonalization, just not feeling connected to others around you. And then this space of low personal accomplishment. I speak with um, people often who feel that they, they aren't being their best self at work and they're not being their best self at home because everything is really blended together. And I just wanna acknowledge that those things are happening. If you're feeling that way, you're certainly not alone in this. And today I'm hoping to give you some tools and some strategies to start to look at things maybe a little bit differently and you can start to think about ways that you can rise above the burnout that you may be feeling. So I have a video um, that I want to start with that hopefully will put us in a place. I watch this often. I've shared it with my teams, and I feel it's a nice place to recenter myself into thinking about where I want to be, where my mindset needs to be, and how I can live my best life. So if for any reason you can't hear it, please let me know in the chat. Um, it should be set up to, to work well. Location, location, location. Brought to you by the Conscious Leadership Group. Find them on the web at www.conscious.is. Animation by Graham Franks, www.grahamfranks.com. One question that conscious leaders ask themselves over and over is, where am I? To support leaders in locating themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money, or time, or space, or energy, or love. People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control, or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, 
find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question. We are hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat, and when it does, a chemical cocktail courses through our veins, and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern-day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity, collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't thrive if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location begins the great conversation. So I love that video because it's a constant reminder of where I want to be and how I personally want to show up in the world. I also can say that when I'm above the line, my life seems to run smoother. It seems to be more joy filled. That curiosity pulls me forward, even in difficult situations. Wanted to also share because a question I often get is, well, well, how often do you go above or below the line? And you can go above or below the line in any given moment. In one moment, you can be above the line. And when you, as you're thinking about appreciation for something in your life or gratitude for a person, and then you can slip below the line when you feel threatened in some way or you're afraid of something. But based on the theory of reciprocal inhibition, one cannot be both anxious and relaxed at the same time. So in other words, you can't simultaneously be above and below the line. So it's a nice way to think about yourself and your, your state of mind before maybe going into a meeting or an interview or something important for you, yourself. Where are you at that moment as you go into a situation that may be a little bit unsettling for you? It helps to be in the curious mode, unless of course you're running from a tiger, saber tooth tiger or snakes or something else that's dangerous to you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And if anyone has a question, feel free to add it to the chat at any time. We'll be monitoring that and happy to answer those questions for you. So what do we do about our burnout? What do we do when we're struggling and having a hard time? How do we get to that point where we can be above the line and be resilient? One of the things that has been really powerful for me over the last years is to think about rising and rising above the line is one way to think about it. And in order to do that, what's really important is to think about these four things. First is to recognize your inherent value. Who you are, how you show up in the world is really important and it's beautiful. No matter what you feel about yourself, you're important to the world. And we wanna really take a moment to recognize that inherent value that you have. We also want to take a really clear look at your inventory and inventory your strengths and your areas of opportunity. We don't want to have blind spots. We want to be able to really fully engage and appreciate ourselves for those areas we need to work on and those areas that are really pretty well developed. We want to next select our lens, which is our outlook. We want to select our mindset with a, an ability to care for ourselves in the process. And last but not least, it's really important that once you can do all those things, you can more readily feel really proud to stand up and share the gifts that you bring. The first one we're going to cover is to recognize your value. What I'd really like to see you do, if you would, is to share in the chat, and I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute, is if you could share in the chat 
some qualities that you appreciate in other people. And I'd certainly love to see all your smiling faces. I see, I see several of you here, Ralph and Peter, Jessica and Ishita. Um, I hope I said your name right. If not, please feel free to correct me, but please share in the chat just some qualities that you appreciate in, in others. So certainly I appreciate compassion, um, integrity, and I hope um, some of you, empathy, absolutely. What are some of the other qualities that um, authenticity, absolutely, especially in leaders. It's really helpful when our leaders are authentic and they come to an environment um, again, empathy, absolutely. When we're, when we're surrounded by people that are like that. I'm a firm believer that those things that we value in others, we also appreciate in ourselves. But it's also in loyalty, absolutely. It's easier oftentimes to share and to see what's valuable in others um, first. And it's a little bit more difficult sometimes to recognize those values in ourselves. So keep in mind that especially those qualities you recognize in others, that means you have those qualities within yourself and you can continue to hone those as you recognize them. Others start to see those as you recognize them in yourselves. What I'd really like for you to do, and you can stay on mute if you'd like, but I'm going to read this quote and I'd love for each of you to just read it out loud. You can be on mute if you want to, certainly, um, but read it with me. You're so hard on yourself. Please take a moment, sit back, marvel at your life, at the grief that has softened you, at the heartache that has wisened you, at the suffering that has strengthened you. Despite everything, you still grow. Be proud of this. And for many of us, we can recognize this. We know that we've been through a lot. We've been through struggles. We've been through pain. And to be kind to ourselves is part of that recognizing our spark, recognizing all these things that we have been through. Dr. Mickey Trockle with our WellMD Center likes to put it this way, that many of us, especially in the law school, especially in these really high pressure situations, there is this pursuit of perfection that we feel that we can't make mistakes, that we have to be perfect. The problem is that there is what's called the human condition, which means that none of us are perfect. None of us are ever going to be perfect. And the only way to really bridge that gap is through compassion and self-compassion and being able to acknowledge that we're just simply not there yet. We would never ever dream of pulling this butterfly out of its cocoon. We would never dream of that. We would never dream of scolding a small child for not being able to run across the room or to walk when it's so young. I love this quote by Maya Angelou. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit to the changes it has gone through to achieve this beauty. And we're all in this. We're all in that same place. And to be able to just take a moment and to acknowledge everything that you've been through. Acknowledge that spark that makes you who you are. And we all have it. And what's really important sometimes is to actually remember somebody, maybe you've lost, that spark is gone because they've passed away. They've lost that spark, we still have it and we need to acknowledge it. We have the opportunity to acknowledge that spark in ourselves. And it also then makes it easier to acknowledge it in others. The second one is to inventory your strengths and opportunities, is to have a really clear picture of who you are. Once you can acknowledge that spark, then it makes it easier to see and acknowledge even the dark parts of our being. We all have a dark side. We can't have a light side without having the elements on the other side that are that are darker, that we have struggles in. Maybe we, we suffer from some depression. Maybe we get down on ourselves. Maybe we get down on others. Maybe we just have a hard time in a certain areas of our lives. We have both the positives and the flip side of that, which are opportunities for our own growth. And so we wanna be able to first acknowledge our humanity and who we are, and then to take a realistic look at ourselves so that we can love every piece of ourselves. 
whether we love that piece of ourselves or not. For me, my emotions have always caused me issues. I've stuffed them down. I've been embarrassed of them. I've gotten emotional at times and I'm learning to love even those. And the more I love those emotions, the less they embarrass me because I can care for them and I can care for myself in the process. And honestly, the emotions are much more in sync with who I am when I can acknowledge them and be kind to myself through the process. When we use our strengths, and that's the one I want to spend the most time on, when we use our strengths in everyday work, we are much happier in life in general. Some great work by Martin Seligman looks at when we use our strengths, the happiness levels of ourselves. And so happiness levels rise, and they'll rise over six months when we start looking at our strengths and how we use them in day-to-day -day places. Depressive symptoms then will go down just in using and taking the time to identify our strengths and start using them in our lives. If you're not familiar with your strengths, um, a free assessment that you can take will look at your character strengths. You can certainly look at your Gallup Strengths Finder as well. It costs about $20. You can get that done online. I love the, the Strengths Finder from Gallup. I also love this one that really focuses on your character strengths. It's a free assessment. You can go to viacharacter.org and you can go to the upper right hand corner and take this free assessment at any point. What you'll receive is a list of 24 of character strengths, and it will be in the order that they exist within you naturally. Now, the tendency I've seen, especially here at Stanford, is that people will look at their bottom strengths and try to raise those up. And I'm here today to talk to you about really embracing what comes naturally to you and those top strengths that appear for you when you take this survey. It's really powerful to be able to understand where those strengths are and what's important to you. That's the other piece of this. When something rises to the top, then you understand that that is a quality that exists naturally in you at a very high rate. And you can start nurturing that in your life and using that in your work environment. When we know and accept ourselves in total, for those places that we want to work on and those places where we have natural strengths. It allows us to be more compassionate with ourselves and with others. It allows us to be curious and growth focused instead of trying to hide our areas of opportunity. It allows us to be more willing to make and admit mistakes. And the only way we can learn is when we admit mistakes and then figure out the best way to solve it in the future. We can be more confident in our authentic selves instead of trying to be somebody we're not. And it makes us more comfortable in relationships when we feel as though we can show up and be our best selves at any time. I love this as a reminder of using the simple power of yet. You may be struggling in an area of your life, you may make a mistake, and then just be able to take a deep breath and say, wow, I learned a lot from that experience. I'm not there yet instead of saying, I, I'll never get there or using some negative self-talk is simply being able to say, I'm not there yet and being willing to learn and grow throughout that process. The next area is really thinking about selecting your lens or your outlook and using self-care as part of this. We all have a different perspective. We come from different backgrounds. We come from different um, ethnicities, we come from different states even that have very different cultures. We come from different either corporate backgrounds, nonprofit backgrounds. We come from educated parents or possibly non-educated parents. I came from North Dakota in a small town. Um, I love nothing more than to, to play out in the farm. And my parents didn't have college degrees. So my perspective on life is a little bit different than those who maybe grew up with a long line of people who had gone to maybe Ivy League schools or college schools. And there was this pressure to go to college and to learn and grow and to be somebody that maybe I didn't have that same pressure to, to do. I had other pressures. I was an athlete. Um, I came to Stanford on an athletic scholarship. So I had very different pressures, um, but I have a different perspective on a lot of things in life. And so just to remember that as we're talking with other people that to have that kindness, to have that empathy, empathy that many of you noted is something you appreciate in others. Part of empathy is really understanding that we all come with a lens. Nobody looks at the same situation with the same 
understanding because we look through a lens of our background, our knowledge, um, and all those things that happen. And yes, the parable of six blind men and the elephant is a perfect example of this. Um, and if for any of you who don't know that, I think we could probably find it and share that story as well. So what does that mean for our happiness level? I like to go back to research. So even though many of us come, we come from different backgrounds, we come from different resources, we come from different circumstances. Again, we may be in a similar storm, but we're not in the same boat. We have very different resources that we come with. But when it comes to happiness, um, I love the research by Do Dr. Sonia Leibermersky, who talks a lot about our thoughts and actions and how they impact our happiness level. She, according to her research, our current circumstances really only amount to about 10% of our happiness. The other 40% is our thoughts and actions and 50% of it is really about genetics. So what does that mean? Well, she looked at two groups of people. She looked at a group of people who became paraplegic and she looked at another group of people who became lottery winners. And what she found is whether the group of people that became lottery winners or the group of people who became paraplegics, both groups, each individual in their own time within six months to a year, went back to exactly the same happiness level they were before the incident. So in other words, if we have a very unhappy person that wins the lottery, they may be happy for a short period of time, but within six months to a year after winning the lottery, they will go back to the same unhappy person they were before winning the lottery. Likewise, if you have a person who's just very happy and thankful, full of abundance and gratitude about life, and they become a paraplegic, they may go through a rough, rough transition, but within six months to a year after the incident, they will revert back to a similar, if not identical happiness level that they were before the incident. And that is because they've chosen to focus their thoughts and actions on, their, on what is working in their life, not as not working in their lives. And the same with the lottery winners. If they're in the habit of thinking about lack and being below the line, all the money in the world is not going to move them above the line to be a happier person. Part of this, and what I think is one of the most important things for us in our happiness is to have a growth mindset. Again, going back to there, I'm not there yet, but I'm willing to learn and constantly learning new skills. I'm happiest when I'm learning. Children are happy when they're learning and they're discovering things. There's this world of awe when we try new experiences, when we learn new things, when we're able to get out of our comfort zone and try something new. Life can get really boring when we don't explore and go out, maybe even in the forest, going out and finding new pathways. Um, even taking a new drive home from the grocery store, a new way to the grocery store, or trying a new gro grocery store opens our mind to possibilities. Those who have a fixed mindset tend to need to look smart. They just feel that I am who I am. I'm fully banked. And they avoid challenges because they don't want to get tipped off that pedestal necessarily. They may give up easily. They see effort as fruitless because they just believe that they are where they are and that's where they're going to be. They ignore feedback or they resent feedback even, and they feel threatened by others' success. Those on the other hand who seek growth opportunities tend to embrace challenges for the sake of learning and growing. They persist in the face of, safe, of setbacks. They see effort as a step to mastery and they just wanna to continue to learn and grow for the process of growing. And that makes them a fun person to be around when they're continually growing, learning new things and excited about life. They welcome criticism, which makes them want to learn from it. They'll take feedback as a gift. I think we've all probably known people who just don't want feedback. They don't wanna hear it. They don't want to, um, know about it, they don't wanna work on it. And then you have other people who just welcome it. They do see it as a gift and they're able to grow and learn from that experience. And one of the most telltale signs is that when somebody is in a growth mindset, they are inspired and encouraged and happy for those people who are successful, that they see somebody who's doing well and they can just embrace that. They can be happy for other people and they can be part of, of the greater whole as we move forward to continue to grow and learn in our environment. 
Another way to look at it is to look at when you're when you're happy, everything's aligned most of the time, right? We're, we're, we're thankful for what we have, even though maybe we don't, we're not maybe earning as much money as we want. Maybe we're not living in the place that is our ultimate place to want to live. Maybe we don't have the exact relationship that we're looking for. And so there's this gap that we may have between what we want and what we have. That's usually what causes stress. When we focus on that gap, the way to bridge that gap is to really to acknowledge the resources we have and that we all that we start to look at what's right in our lives because it's not where we are it's about how we feel about where we are and so yes we all want to grow and learn maybe we want to get that next level job maybe we want to become partner maybe we want to move into a larger home or move to another city or find this promotion or get this promotion but if we can where we are right now be thankful for what we have acknowledge what that is, and to start seeing what's right in our lives as we move towards what we want in the future, it changes everything because it bridges that gap between where we are and where we want to be and continuing to be curious. So the ways I've found to bridge that gap is to certainly start out with being compassionate, have self-compassion for yourself instead of saying, well, I should have been doing this or I should have earned this by now or I should be in this other place. I like to let go of the word should in my vocabulary altogether. You may have had opportunities in the past and at the time you did the best you could with where you were and you either chose not to do it or pursue it. Having self-compassion for yourself wherever you are right now and acknowledging that where you are is perfectly fine and that you wanna move forward is a beautiful step in the right direction. Again, having gratitude for everything that is in your life. And, and then I'm gonna share with you an exercise called three good things. So what I'd love for you to put in the chat, if you would, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing again. Go ahead and if you would share in the chat, in the chat something that you are truly thankful for right now something that um, you just feel really positive about your life. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's your role, maybe it's your home or your children, maybe it's um, a new opportunity at work or in your environment. What's something that you feel good health? Absolutely. Hopefully all of us can right now feel <laughs> wiener dog. I love wiener dogs and I'm sure Ziggy is adorable, a supportive partner, thankful you're for your family. Those are all just really beautiful things. Now, while you're thinking about what you're thankful in your life, what I'd really like for you to do is go ahead and take your phone out. And I'd like to have you text somebody in your life. It could be anybody. Maybe it's somebody you haven't talked to for a while. And I'd just like you to send a simple text that says, dear so-and-so, or if you don't even have to put dear, say, thank you for being in my life. As simple as that. Thank you for being in my life. Or if that seems a little bit too soft for you, maybe you can thank them for something specific. Maybe thank you for taking me to the airport. Thank you for helping me with this project. Send a little thank you text to somebody in your life. Maybe somebody that isn't experienced, that isn't expecting it, but please go ahead and send somebody that text. I'm going to go ahead while you do that, we're going to get back to that, um, but go ahead and send that text and feel free to send it to a couple of people. If you'd rather do that, that's fine too. Feel free to, to send that to a couple of people. And it looks like I actually went ahead a couple slides. So going back to gratitude, gratitude is one of the most important elements for a happy life. And what Brene Brown often talks about is they're having a difficult time really figuring out, is it the happy people that are grateful because they have what they want? Or is it the grateful people that are happy? And I would say that it's the grateful people who are happy because wherever they are, we find grateful people and happy people all over the world, regardless of circumstances. They may be in poverty, but yet we find happy people even in poverty. So other people may be in struggling situations, but yet they find happiness. We all know those people, despite no matter what they're going through, they still tend to have this happiness about them. And it's often perplexing to those of us who think, wow, how can they be happy living in those circumstances? But the reality is 
no matter what your circumstances are, when you're filled with gratitude for what you have, it makes it easier for you to move forward in your life, to find other things to be grateful for, and to actually find success in your world. Because what I've found is the more grateful I am, the more my life is filled with other grateful people who want to support me in anything I do. When I've been in times when I haven't been grateful, those resources dry up because people tend to not want to be around people who aren't grateful in their own lives, who aren't thankful, who aren't kind, who aren't generous with their time and their attention because they're too miserable in their own circumstances. So anytime you feel that you are falling below the line and that you are not in a place that you want to be, taking a moment to thank somebody for being in your life, to taking a moment to remember the value that comes in your life and the good things in your life will help you to move almost immediately back above the line. The research by Robert Emmons um, here locally at, at University of California at Davis has done a lot of research on gratitude. And he's got some great books that if you wanna learn more about the research, you certainly can take a look at. What he found is that when we count our blessings versus our burdens, that gratitude is uniquely responsible for the effect of the intervention on positive effect. In other words, it helps people be more positive. Those interventions helped you sleep better because think about going to bed at night, thinking about what's right in your life, instead of going, trying to fall asleep, thinking about all the problems that you have. Furthermore, those, it, those positive impact of gratitude is noticeable by spouses and others around you. So it has a ripple effect of positivity. Research by John Gottman has also found that this, it's similar with, um, with relationships. So not just at work where um, Barbara Fredrickson does a lot of work about what's called um, a positivity ratio, that we find that when we have at least three positives to every one negative, relationships do better. In a, a flourishing marriage or for flourishing relationships, there's at least five positive interactions to every one negative. And that negative could just be some feedback, which isn't always negative, but everything from eye rolling to um, snapping at somebody, all of those things impact as well. It could be the tone of the voice, but thinking about the, the positivity ratio, as you think about your relationships, which relationships do you really value? Which are the ones that really build you up? Which are the ones that tear you down? Which are the ones that are flourishing? And which are the ones that could be impacted when we start being more positive in those relationships and adding a more positivity ratio into what's happening in our lives? And think about this as you go back home to your, um, to your significant other or others in your life. I had to go through this with my six, then 16-year-old son, where I realized when I found out this research, all I was doing was nagging him. And I had to learn, turn that around, flip it upside down, and dig deep to find some positive things <laughs> to say about my son at the time, because I was having a really hard time. But understanding the research about how those relationships are negatively impacted, whether we're positive or negative, is a really telling sign. Now, for those of you who um, went ahead and did that activity where you texted somebody a, um, a, a really gratitude-filled text, what I will say, and some of you may get a phone call, some of you may get a text back and say, is everything okay? Well, if you get that and somebody's really panicked, you may want to look at the positivity ratio there. That shouldn't necessarily be a text that should shock somebody. It should be something that really just enhances that positivity ratio for you. So if you text somebody and say, well, I'm so thankful to have you in your life, and they pick up the phone and say, is everything okay? Did something happen? What's going on? Then you may want to think about what are your positivity ratios with others in your life, and how can you enhance that by building them up? So I have a, one of my favorite activities in the world, and it's so simple but it's so research-based. It has been researched a lot by a lot of different groups. It was first started by Martin Seligman, who's the really the father of positive psychology. And this activity called Three Good Things that I'm gonna share with you really only takes about four minutes a day. If you do it for a total of one hour over two weeks, you will be happier in six months from now more happy than if you were on a placebo and more recently they've found you'll be even happier than if you were on Prozac. This intervention, which literally takes less than four minutes a day, you only have to do it for one to two weeks, will have lasting impacts for you for up to six months. 
And I would say if, if you continue the exercise, it certainly goes beyond that. And, and I see this comment about um, as a parent that you were with you with the positivity ratio. I've done this with my children and it, it does have a really remarkable effect. So if any of you are afraid of snakes, you might want to squint your eyes a little bit because I've got a snake coming up. So here, I want to just point this out that for evolutionary reasons, as we saw in the video early on, we are hardwired to remember the negative in our life. We are hardwired to be aware of those things in our life that could hurt us, those things that could kill us, those things could, that could, you know, really just impact our sense of survival. The problem is that we no longer live in the wilderness. We no longer live in the era of saber-toothed tigers and rattlesnakes, although I live in the Santa Cruz mountains, so I find rattlesnakes a fair amount, and I do, they do get my attention, but we are hardwired to, to see something that's a threat to us and then react to it. Our cortisol goes up, we feel threatened, and we stay in this state. And for many of us, we live in that state because we're continually in this place of just hyper sensitivity and looking for things. If you can imagine when you see a snake like this in the yard, you're not turning around and then going to enjoy the daisies. You're still in that hyper vigilant mode of what's going to hurt me and where am I gonna go with this? And so what we wanna do is flip the script on this because for evolutionary reasons, this is exactly what we were, were built to do. We haven't got caught up yet in this new world we're in. Our, our coworkers are not in general. I mean, there's going to be once in a while a, a really horrible incident, but that's not happening here. We don't have to be looking for those things. What we wanna do is flip the script and start shining the light on the good things in our lives. It's important to really look at what's good in our lives and focusing on what that is, because we can either stay hardwired to look for the negative in our lives. And even with relationships, that first six months, that person is the best thing since sliced bread. They're the be end all, they're everything we ever wanted. And then for evolutionary reasons, within six months or so, we start looking at and looking for the negative things in that person. And that really starts bringing that relationship down. So how do we keep focused on the good things in our lives? The exercise is simply this. Within two hours before you go to bed at night, or just before, but certainly within two hours of when you go to bed, write down what three things went well today and what your role in was making that happen. What did you do today? What went well today? And what did you do as part of that? I think it's a really great thing to look at. You can do it with a family. You could do it with coworkers. Um, certainly if you do it with coworkers, that's not typically within two hours of when you go to bed, you can start a day that way. But any time you can shine the light on what's going well in the world is really an important way to do it. What the research shows is that when you do this and you start looking at the positive things in your life, by day four or five, reflecting on these positive things leads to you starting to notice even more positive things in your life. And it only takes up to four to five days to do this. And I've seen this happen with my then other 17 year old son who was going through a really difficult time. We started focusing on what was positive in his life, even though that first day he could not come up with a single thing positive in his life. By the third or fourth day, he was able to start seeing those things and identifying those things that were going well in his life. What the clinical trials have shown is that when we start focusing on the positive of our lives, our burnout and depression go down because again, we're focusing on what's good in our lives. Our con I think she froze. <laughs> Looks like she lost her internet connection, maybe. Yes. All right. And dreaming about what's right in our world. So our last area that we want to really want to focus on is enjoying sharing your gifts. We all have them, but sometimes we hide them. We don't know what to do with them because we haven't done the first things. We haven't fully embraced who we are for our good areas and our shadow areas. We haven't fully embraced that. We don't know where we are. So we tend to be sailboats on a sea sometimes, just waiting for the next opportunity and hoping we fit in instead of being really strong with who we are and where we want to be. Having a vision is a really big part of this. And having a vision just means that you have an ability to see your work in life in a way that is personally meaningful, stimulating, inspiring, and 
and fulfilling and in alignment to who you are. It's important to have that and know who you want to be. How do you want to show up in the world? What are the qualities that you appreciate in yourself and others so that you can bring those to work with you and be firm in who you are? Having non-negotiables in your life, knowing what's important. For me, my non-negotiables in life are having a, um, an environment where kindness is a value, that kindness is a place where we all can come and be kind to each other. I will not work in an environment that doesn't promote kindness. I also won't work in an environment that doesn't encourage growth in all areas of our lives. Those are my non-negotiables. And I strive to make sure that my work environment is conducive to that. That's part of my vision for who I wanna be and how I want my world to be. If you're not sure and not really clear about that vision for yourself, consider making a vision board. We even have a class through, through Be Well, through our Healthy Living Program, about creating your own vision board. You can be in brainstorming mode with coworkers, friends, your family. You can really tap into the energy of your peers around your strengths about what you want to do. And certainly having a mentor to help you really fine tune who you are and who you want to be in the world. There's something that's called the heliotropic effect. And that means that societies, cultures, and organizations, groups, and individuals tend to work towards their most positive image we hold of ourselves. We work towards that. The term heliotropic comes from the term that means the plants grow and move towards the sun. People do the same thing. That's why when we get down on ourselves and we think, oh, well, why bother? I may as well just go do X because we don't have that most positive vision of ourselves. When we start to cultivate the most positive vision of who we are and start to imagine that in ourselves, we will start moving towards that vision of ourselves. It's part of who we are. We can move towards that most valuable vision, but we have to know what that vision is. Um, being again on a sailboat, just waiting for that next opportunity or wondering what somebody might like about us isn't serving us well. When we get firm in who we are and get confidence in who we are and knowing who we are as a person, then we can start moving towards that best vision of ourselves. Again, we're not going to be perfect in that, but we are able to move there knowing we're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction. One of my favorite activities, um, and certainly take a screenshot of this, is this is something you'd like to do. I've also done this with my kids. I've also done this with, with team members, is to start, is to think about creating a vision statement or a mission statement for yourselves. And if you take a screenshot of this, it's just a template. You don't have to follow it exactly, but it gives you a template for creating a vision statement for your life and your world. Mine just happens to be that my life's work is to create soul lifting connections that allow me to share science based best practices, which inspire joy filled living. And I'm hoping that today's class has helped you think about that, thinking about how you can craft the world in a way that's meaningful to you so that you can start moving to that very, very best version of yourself. And I wanna end, and I'm gonna, we have about 10 minutes for some questions or conversations, but if your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. And that is one of the things that I want to share with each of you as you consider your world, how you show up in the world, how you communicate with other people and where you wanna be. Here's my email address. And we have 10 minutes that we can talk um, talk about any questions that any of you have. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I hope that this content is valuable to you, that maybe you learned something. I'd love to hear from any of you in the chat, something that you are willing to take away from today's class and either share with a family member, coworkers, or something else, something that you're willing to work for and to, to bring into your world. Is there anybody that would be willing to share that with us? I go. <laughs> Please, thank you. Um, it really resonated uh, with me uh, how you described as a, as a parent uh, your struggle. I've noticed that with my kids. Um, it's it's definitely definitely changing the the attitude when um, I show I show a good example to what my kids that they uh, they also you know. Uh, find for themselves a better, uh, there's a better 
environment at home. Mm. And it's not easy. I mean, at the time when my son was, um, you know, I, I will admit it, and and I I I don't I don't admit it readily because it shows what kind of parent I was. I was, you know, I was very young when I had my children. I was 22 when my son was born, and I was probably not at all ready to have a child. I'd graduated from Stanford three months, you know just prior to that. And I had no idea what I was doing. So here's my son and just struggling with him. And I had high expectations and he would, he was 17 years old. He was um, living at home, his room. You could, I, I'm not exaggerating to say you couldn't see the floor. He, mm -hmm. I cleaned his room. I cleaned okay. his room for his birthday present. I said, I'm not buying you anything. And when he went on a weekend trip, I cleaned his room. I literally found, and this is not an exaggeration, I was such a bad parent. I actually posted this on Facebook. I found 156 pair of dirty socks in his room mm -hmm. when I cleaned it. Mm -hmm. I was mortified. And, and then I felt justified. Well, my, my, my term of endearment for my son was the transient pig. And I thought it was kind of funny. I thought it was, a, but what I didn't realize is how much I was you know, reinforcing that negative of him. Like if I make him feel like he's a transient pig, his heliotropic effect, what is he going towards? Except, well, why would I even bother cleaning my room if who I am is a transient pig? Um, I didn't know when he was in the home, house half the time. So I felt justified until I saw the research. Right. And I think even as managers, we can get into this place of, well, they didn't do this and they didn't do that. So of course I need to, you know, be somewhat critical of this instead of finding a way to find the good in every single person that we work with and lifting them up, because that's all any of us really want. Right, um, I agree. Uh, as a parent, um, it's the, the work as, as a manager is also kind of the same um, goal of lifting uh, your team members um, as a team member um, in previous uh, jobs, I have seen how not being uh, encouraged and uh, lift, lift up uh, kind of drove me away from previous job mm -hmm. situations. Um, so um, I, I, I see a, a commonality there, definitely. Thank you. Loy, is that how you say your name? Yes. Thank so you. I'm, um, see the t-shirt behind me, S-A-G-E. That's uh, Science Accelerating Girls Engagement. So we have a one week camp virtual and these are high school girls so it's science but we do have professional growth sessions 45 minutes a day for for five days and session two is about self-awareness and then part of it is self-care and so i came in late i only started at 11 45 and yet in the 10 minutes that i listened to you it was amazing like we could use that or we could use that we could use the three thing three good things or we could use the and so my question is, is it realistic to, or how do we introduce some things like this when we only have 45 minutes of their time a day, virtually? And this is like 50 girls that would be in small groups of six or seven. You know, just planting the seeds, uh, uh, you know, what I really love to do is finding these. And I really, I'm starting to think it's kind of my life's work is finding these sort of tools and hacks and tricks that really are science-based and make a difference. And when you when you use them, it changes things. It changes things across the board. And I know we did um, record this session today, so you know you'll be able to, to watch it. There are some great tools and trip, tick, um, tips in there to just start using them. And it's about habits, um, as we saw earlier on. Um, Sonia Libermersky, you know, she did all this research, and it's about what we decide to think about. It's our thoughts and our beliefs and, and that all blends together in a way that makes us either a happier person or not. I know for me, if I, at the end of the day, spend even a half an hour in front of the news, I just, I get in a really bad mood and I, I, I have a hard time shaking it off. Now, I'm not saying that we should put our head in the sand and be an ostrich. What I'm saying is figure out what it is you need to know about the world I'm better off if I read what's happening in the world than watching the news that inflame, seems to inflame everything. Um, pay attention to how you're feeling. And I think that's one of the biggest gifts I've gotten in the last year is I've started to pay attention to my emotions, how I'm feeling, and 
I don't want to feel that angst. I don't want to feel that negativity because it spills out into the rest of my world. And so if I look at finding resources and ways for me to become a happier person, those around me, I see, become happier as well because we start together focusing on what we can impact in a positive way. Yeah, session five is on habits. Who did you say it was, Sonia? Well, Sonia Libermersky, if you watch the video, I referenced Sonia Libermersky. When you're talking about habits, and I didn't bring up um, him, but BJ Fogg does some great work on habits. And if you ever wanted to, to connect with me outside the class, happy to do that. I wrote down your email address, Patty Sue at stanford.edu. It rhymes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. So I'd be happy to, to support that. It sounds like a great group of, of girls. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Martin made a great comment that he feels better when he limits his time on social media. Uh, yes. I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. Well, there's a lot of research on that too, that the more time we spend on social media, the more we get this inflated vision that everybody else's life is better than ours. And nobody else's life matters. Only your life matters. And to start really focusing on how you feel about your life and where you are, because the moment we start comparison, comparing, you know, somebody said, and I don't remember who the quote was from, but um, comparison is the thief of joy. It really robs of, of us our joy when we start comparing ourselves. Now, the one place that that's, I don't believe in is if you are a growth person, and you start looking at, like, I have a mentor here at Stanford, and I'm going to compare myself, compare my actions to her actions so I can learn from her. That, to me, is a fine comparison because I'm not comparing myself as higher or lower. I'm just looking at what she may do that I can learn from and benefit from. So it's not a matter of who's on a better, higher scale. I like comparing just so I can say, well, I'm interesting. I wonder what she might do differently that I can learn from so that I can be better at X. Um, that's the one place where I think comparison is good. I was an athlete in um, high school and college here at Stanford and comparing myself to what somebody else does was really important because I did want to become stronger and better, but it wasn't about me being less good. It was about what are they doing to bring them to that level so that I can learn from them. And the same is true with these tools and techniques for living a happier life. Thank you so much. Body. Thank you. Really happy to be here today. Um, great to um, spend this time with you and hope that all of you received even one little tool or tip that you can bring up back into your world. So thank oh. you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.